Okay, we can start. Good evening and thank you very much for all of you who are here today. Thank you for coming to the 20th Luca Dagliano lecture, 20 years of Luca Dagliano lectures. And we're extremely honored to have today with us Sergei Guriev. Uh, I'm not saying anything on Sergei because Thierry, who is the chairman of the advisory board of the Centro Studi Luca Dagliano, will introduce Sergei. But I have to thank him for being with us today. I know he has a very busy schedule and uh, he will deliver absolutely fascinating lecture. So we're really looking forward to that lecture. Uh, I, what I want to do now is to give the floor to Francesco Profumo, who is our host, in fact. The, the Compagnia di San Paolo supports all the activities of uh, Il Collegio Carlo Alberto. They, they, they keep asking us to become more independent. But oh, okay. <laughs> ask, become <laughs> more sustainable. See, they they the say we should become more sustainable, but we still rely a lot on them. So, Francesco, thank okay. you very much for introducing us. And also, you support the Centro Studi Luca Dagliano and you fund this lecture. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for saying a couple of words. And then First of all, thank, thank you, you, Giorgio. Thank you for this great events. You know, uh, once when uh, the Collegio was in Moncalieri, was a really an excellent research center, but was only research center. Now is really the center of the city. Uh, they, can, uh, they organize more than 200 events during the year. And this is uh, really a, one of the think tank uh, uh, entities in the, the city. And uh, today, that is very difficult to get people together just to have a discussion, free discussion. The role of the Collegio, and thank you to Giorgio, is uh, every day more important. And tonight, we have a special guest. And this is very good for us. Then you know that, that this is a 20 uh, Luca Dagliano lecture. This means that uh, 20 years ago, we started uh, this uh, collaboration between the Centro Studi Luca Dagliano and the Compagnia di San Paolo. Now strengthened because of the close links between the Center and the Collegio Carlo Alberto. Then we have uh, one new link. It's not only the Compagnia, but it's the Collegio too. The, this lecture is about uh, spin dic dictators new breeds of autocracies based less on fears but on restrictions of basic liberties and the pretension of being democratic. And we have also one subtitle, Dictatorship. I think it's especially important to deal with this topic and to increase the awareness of the risks of these contemporary political systems especially today, a special day, the International Holocaustus, Holocaustus Remembrance Day. Then, thank you. I, I'm sure that uh, this will be a very special talk. And uh, I'm sorry that I have to leave, but I have to go to train to tonight. Okay, thank you. It's very important that we remember that it's the International Holocaust Remembrance Day and actually talking about how dictatorships are evolving today and what's happening in the contemporary world and how civil liberties are taken away from people but in much subtler way than we than probably in the, in the beginning of the last century. I think it's very important, it's crucial. Thierry. Okay, thank you, Giorgio. Um, so I, I'm very, very pleased to um, to welcome here Sergey for this uh, uh, Luca D'Agliano lecture on development economics. Uh, I, I want to just say a few words on uh, the trajectory of, of Sergey and to put into context a little bit uh, his, his recent research. Um, Sergey is, is, is really a pure product of uh, Russian academic excellence in economics. And he started to be trained first as a physicist and a mathematician at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Mathematics, Technology, sorry, and at the Russian Academy of Sciences, 
where then he specialized into economics. That's a trajectory that actually uh, is sometimes very much used by many economists in the world, but Sergey is a very brilliant example of this. After that, um, Sergey became a leading scholar in economics, and more appropriately, he also became a very dynamic academic entrepreneur at the uh, New School of Economics, where he was the rector uh, almost, uh, ten, more than, almost 10 years, from 2004 to 2013. And through that uh, period, he made that institution, the very well-praised and appreciated institutions in Europe for, for economic research and training. Uh, then, uh, with sudden events, because of his position somehow not really appreciated in his own country uh, by some people, uh, he had to move very quickly to France, where uh, he entered at Sciences Po, and where he's assuming now the functions of provost at, this, at that institution. Uh, and, of course, is still expanding his skills as an entrepreneur in this brilliant French institution that, of course, I'm quite familiar with. Um, it, let me say as well that beyond being simply a well-established and distinguished economist in the academic world, uh, Sergei is also very much involved in policy making, and he occupied the position of chief economist at the EBRD, and he was also a member of the executive committee of the EBRD uh, during three years when he was on leaves uh, from Sciences Po. Uh, now, getting more specifically into the scientific context of the career of uh, Sergei, uh, it's not difficult to look around in the CV and see that he has published in the most prestigious uh, journals in economics and that he had worked in, in several areas. Of course, today he's going to talk on political economy, but he started essentially by uh, having papers on uh, corporate governance and contract theory. Then he moved also and get interested into uh, regional labor mobility and illegal migration. Uh, and certainly because of his background and the country in which he was, he was very much inspired into getting uh, interested in the functioning of oligarchic structures in authoritarian regimes. Uh, and that's what uh, is basically the source of his inspiration for the next talk that he's gonna get today. Uh, he's also very much interested, not only in terms of looking at dictatorships and oligarchic structures, but also something which is particularly relevant for our democracies, namely the emergence uh, and the development of populism, and what are the consequences and the implications of populism in, in democratic structures, uh, countries. And in that respect, I mean, he's leading one of the uh, CPR, the, um, uh, what CPR is, I, I forgot Center already, for Center for Economic Policy Research in London, uh, and on the topic of uh, political and economic populism. Uh, in, in political economy of populism. Now, in that respect, I mean, actually, I, I went through, and there's a very nice paper that for those of you who are economists and young students here, that if you want to get a kin of uh, what is going on in that research area on populism, uh, he has this piece in the Journal of Economic Literature written with Elias Papayuanu, which is a, a, a remarkable piece summarizing and expanding all what has been done in political science and economics on that topic of populism. So I really recommend you to go through that lecture, uh, to that reading, and that's, that's really, it's a, it's, a, it's a thick paper, but it's worth paying the cost of uh, reading that paper because you learn a lot about populism in that, uh, and all the literature on that in social sciences. Uh, today, uh, Sergey is gonna talk on also a very important topic, as it said, he has been dictators, uh, and uh, he has been working on that for some time with one of his co-authors, Daniel Tresman, who was a political scientist. Uh, and the idea there, of course, is that dictatorship has a new face, uh, what he called the, uh, informational, the, the informational autocratic leaders that tend to manipulate information to pretend to be what they are not and make sure that people believe that. So without you, I'm going to leave the floor now to uh, Sergey, and he's going to explain us uh, and tell us more about those spin dictators who are particularly worrying for our current world. Sergey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Terry, and thank you for your work as chairman of the advisory board of the 
of the Centro Studi Luca D'Agliano to, to keep loyalty in introducing our lectures. Thank you very much, Thierry. Sergei. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thierry, for those uh, kind words. And thank you, Giorgio and Francesca, for inviting me here. I'll try to stand up. If uh, the microphone still works, I will stand. If, uh, yeah, if, uh, if it doesn't, I'll sit down again. It's OK? It's OK? Yeah? OK. The question if it, if it works for people watching online. That's a different question. So yeah. <laughs> OK, good. good. OK, um, uh, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, in this country, there'll be uh, several times during the talk when I'll mention Italy for a very important reason. But in general, what uh, Thierry said is also very interesting. There are certain uh, features of uh, Italy and Russia that created a demand for political economists. There are many Russian political economists and many Italian political economists. French political economists also exist. Uh, and Thierry is a wonderful example of that, but uh, um, the disproportionate uh, number of Italian political economists and Russian political economists is a testimony to something very important, and uh, I'll talk about that. So, but you can guess why already. So, um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is indeed related to issues of development, to issues of international economics, but as Thierry has said correctly, this is joint work with a political scientist. I learned a lot. And it's my f first book and first series of papers co-authored with a political scientist. And uh, that's been a, an amazing experience. I'm very happy um, that we produced this book. But I will also make explicit references to issues related to globalization, international economics. And uh, this thing emerged exactly because of globalization. And I'll tell you why and how. So this thing is indeed the phenomenon of spin dictators. And basically, the modern dictators are different from what dictators used to be. Even visually, if you look at dictators in 20th century, they look uh, like they want to project fear. They want to terrorize you. Sometimes they also use larger-than-life ideology. And uh, this country is also not, uh, 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 not unfamiliar with that. But one of the things is uh, the dictator in 20th century is somebody who wants to produce uh, terror, wants to terrorize the citizens into submission. And that's why very often dictators actually use, uh, used to wear military uniform. Some of them were real officers or generals. Some of them were actually not, but still used military uniform. And in this sense, uh, uh, it is striking to what extent current dictators are even looking differently. And uh, uh, when you look at current non-democratic leaders, more often than not, they actually wear uh, civ uh, civilian suits like mine, travel to Davos, talk to business leaders, talk to democratic leaders. And uh, they, most importantly, pretend to be Democrats, as, as we already said. And so, interestingly, uh, they use repression, but they use much less repression. They use it in a covert, deniable way. They also don't have ideology. This is something that will probably come up in questions to what extent you can say that Orban has ideology or Putin has ideology. Uh, what I'm meaning here is none of modern dictators has an ideology like Nazism or Bolshevism. That is something that uh, is a uh, completely thing of the past. Now, um, I'll talk about pioneers of those regimes, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Alberto Fujimori from Peru. But uh, one of the things where I would like to mention Italy, Italy had a democratic leader who is a friend of Putin, who taught Putin a lot. And I think that Putin actually learned from Lee Kuan Yew, but not from Fujimori and from his Italian friend. Uh, overall, um, uh, you see that uh, we call uh, Putin point one being a spin dictator, and that's another issue. What happens to spin dictators, how they transform, how they change over time. So this is also something that I'm going to talk about. Now, um, uh, we are not saying that uh, all dictators today are spin dictators. That all dictators today are using manipulation of information rather than terror. You still have old style dictators like North Korea or Syria. Uh, you also can say that Putin in 2022 came back to the old model. And I'll talk exactly why and how it's happened. 
And uh, of course, Lukashenko is also an old style, brutal dictator. Uh, but uh, they are few. What we do in this book and in the research papers uh, uh, on, on which this book is based, we actually collect data and we count different kinds of the regimes. And uh, we show that majority of dictators today are actually uh, spin dictators. And this is uh, one uh, graph that uh, you can see in this book that uh, when you classify non-democratic regimes and uh, sort them by time when they came to power and only count long-serving regimes, we uh, kick out everybody who serves uh, less than five years, you have a critical shift about three, uh, three decades ago, uh, which uh, qualitatively changed the face of tyranny. And now face of tyranny is, uh, sorry, oops, I'm, I'm uh, pressed the wrong button. Face of, uh, face of tyranny is this rather than this. Now, this book is a, is a book for general audience, and that's pretty much the only graph I'll show you today. Uh, but uh, if you want to look at the data, there is a website which has all the data, all the graphs, all the tables, and code to reproduce uh, those graphs and tables. Uh, the website spindictators.com. Now, one main message that I would like to pre uh, present you today is that average dictator today is not what it used to be. It's not a dictator that uses repression openly and unashamedly. This is somebody who pretends to be a democratic leader and tries to manipulate information to convince the public that he is popular, democratic, competent leader. And so that is, that is the message. We are not saying that this transformation is complete. We are not saying that uh, uh, this uh, transformation is irreversible. You know that making forecasts, especially about the future, is hard. Uh, but uh, what we are saying is that today we observe this state of affairs and we can describe it and we can speculate about what's going to happen. And we also can give recommendations what to do about this. So um, uh, I will talk now about uh, how these regimes function. Then I'll talk about why we think this transformation has taken place in recent decades. And then I'll talk about recommendations for the West. So um, basically the main difference between the old style regime and new style regime is that old style regime uh, rules through fear and that's why we call them fear dictatorship. Spin dictatorships rule through deception. That's why we call them spin dictators like spin doctors in democracy. And basically what we do, we collect data on repression over time. We collect data on political killings, political prisoners, torture, and we see that uh, non-democratic regimes use much less of repression today than they did uh, half, a, half a century ago. Uh, what is most important is that current dictators like to conceal their violence. It's not that how much of violence they use, but uh, actually that the fact is that they deny that they use repression. And that, of course, means that they need to use little repression, targeted repression, because uh, if you use too much repression, it becomes noticed. So I'll give you a quote from Gaddafi. Gaddafi is an interesting character who came to power during the high time of fear dictatorships, and he exited power when his model became unfashionable. Right? So he kind of outlived his, uh, his era. So this guy uh, actually said on record, when he looked around and already saw in, uh, increasing uh, importance of spin dictatorships, who uh, kill their opponents in car accidents or poison them quietly, Gaddafi said, we don't do that. If we need to execute somebody, we execute on television. And so Gaddafi was one of those guys who uh, was uh, very clear about uh, using uh, uh, force. And now here is an example of Vladimir Putin. You know that um, one of opposition leaders, Boris Nemtsov, was killed in 2015 in front of the Kremlin. Uh, Vladimir Putin said, it's not me, and it's a provocation against me. And eventually he even found the killers of uh, Boris Nemtsov, but then he denied that they worked for him. And basically these were soldiers of, uh, of uh, interior ministry, but still he said, it's not me. And uh, it's actually killing Boris Nemtsov is a provocation against me. 
And that is uh, something that is very, very common. Whenever something happens to opponents of those dictators, they say, that's not us. Uh, they also use other tools. Uh, they use, instead of sending their opponents to you know, prison for 10 years, they use repeated multiple arrests, and we give a lot of examples of that in, in, <coughs> in the book. But one example is uh, this Russian opposition leader, Ilya Yashin, who tried to run for, for uh, a legislature in 2019 in Moscow, and he couldn't because he was arrested for uh, various non-political offenses five times in a row. So he would come out of prison. He thought, now I will uh, run a campaign and apply uh, register for the election. The time, the moment he was released from prison, he was arrested again and put in prison again for another week and sometimes for two weeks. Uh, they also use non-political crimes. Uh, this is an example of a Kurdish politician, Nuritin Demirtas, in, in, in Turkey, who in the end of 2000s, and not in the end of notice, was arrest, arrested not for being a Kurdish politician, but for faking a medical certificate to avoid military draft. Uh, Alexei Navalny... Uh, was arrested and house arrested for defrauding a cosmetic company, not for being a political opponent. And Vladimir Putin would repeatedly say, this is not an opposition politician. This is a fraudster who doesn't pay taxes. If he were in the West, he would also be in jail. And this is a typical approach to repression in those regimes. Uh, they also, this, uh, these uh, guys also have elections, and these elections actually have opposition parties. And uh, these elections usually result, uh, result in uh, outcomes uh, where the ruling party doesn't get 90% of the vote. We also give data in the, in the book that uh, the share of regimes where the parliament is controlled by 100% 100 of seats in the parliament are controlled by one party or 95 or 90% con are controlled by one party, the share of such regimes has declined dramatically. You pretend to have opponents, and uh, you harass them. If they are real opponents, you harass them, and uh, you don't give them access to the media. Uh, and that may happen through censorship, that may happen through captation of media owners. And uh, instead of banning access of opposition leaders to elections uh, legally, openly, you do it in a, in a uh, way uh, I just mentioned, when you harass a politician, not physically allowing him to campaign through non-political arrests, or through denying equal access to the media. So uh, this is becoming more and more common over time. Now, one of the other things is how these people speak. So what we did, we collected data on composition of, on, 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 on composition of speeches of various political leaders. So we took speeches of Hitler, we took speeches of Putin, Nazarbayev, and Nazarbayev features very prominently in our book, actually a guy who ran Kazakhstan for almost 30 years. It's a, it's a wonderful, interesting story. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, but also, also democratic leaders like uh, Sarkozy or uh, uh, Obama. And basically, I don't know if you can see this slide. This slide gives you different colors and different types of leaders. Spin dictators, uh, uh, old-style fear dictators, and democratic leaders. And we counted, uh, we counted uh, words related to fear and violence, and to economic performance and public goods provision. And basically, all style dictators talk about fear, violence, terror, enemies. New style dictators talk about economy, public goods provision, budget. And when you actually count these words, you can find a statistical regularity, which is, statistically, you cannot distinguish between speeches of spin dictators and Democrats. And both of them are statistically significantly different from speeches of uh, old-style fear dictators. So this is a different rhetoric. Their speeches are actually different. So, uh, and the reason for that is they want to blend in. They want to present themselves as democratic leaders. So this is a, a little uh, uh, table comparing di different tools. As I mentioned, uh, the difference is fear versus de uh, de deception. Since you need to hide and deny your repression whenever you use it, you use a little of it. Because if you use too much, it gets noticed. Um, 
what is more important is you uh, you always try to uh, hide the fact that uh, you use uh, uh, repression and censorship. And the beauty of censorship that don't not many people realize that, but the beauty of censorship is you can censor information about censorship itself. So in Soviet Union, you would have a ministry of censorship called Glovlit. It's open. Everybody knows. In uh, modern Russia, constitution says no censorship. Censorship is forbidden. And uh, people don't realize until very recently when censorship became open again, uh, people didn't realize that media are not free. In modern Hungary, there is no censorship, but there is co-optation of media. In uh, uh, Fujimori's Peru, uh, there were several kinds of tools. They were, they were tabloids financed by the regimes. But then there were also co-optation of TV, uh, TV owners. Uh, uh, Peru is a very interesting case. Economists and political economists probably know this story. 20 years ago, two economists actually published a very influential paper uh, on Fujimori's Peru. Basically, Fujimori's chief of uh, uh, domestic uh, intelligence, Montesinos, uh, said, we will not be as clumsy as Pinochet. We'll do it in a more subtle way. And so he bribed political opponents. He bribed media. He bribed judges. But he didn't trust those people. And you can understand him. Uh, so he took receipts. And he recorded videos. And today, if you go on YouTube, you can search for Vladi videos. This, names, uh, this guy names was conveniently Vladimir as well. Uh, so uh, he, this, in these videos, he gives money to these people. He keeps it as, a, as a evidence uh, to enforce the corruption deals. But this is not the most important part. The most important part is we have a registry of who costs how much. How much it costs to how much uh, Montesinos paid to judges, senators, uh, opposition members of parliament, and journalists, and TV owners. And the most valuable uh, counterparties for him were exactly media. And he famously said once about an opposition politician's uh, press conference, this press conference was not shown on TV, so this press conference actually did not happen. And so this is the idea. You censor, but you censor in a covered way, and people may not realize that they are living in a non-censored state. And we actually look at the data on this, and I can show the data if, if you have questions. We actually show that in those countries, people don't understand how controlled the media are. So if you ask people living in Russia, say, five years ago, and living in France five years ago, Russians would be more likely to say, media in my country is free than the French. So, uh, and that is also why some truly opposition media are also allowed, but they cannot get to a big audience. And then the regime says, we don't have censorship. <laughs> opposition media are not watched big or not read because they're not popular. And so that's, that's how it works. Uh, now, one other thing, as I mentioned, is ideology. The other thing is um, propaganda. Propaganda delivers a very different message. Propaganda delivers a message of competence and popularity. These leaders uh, are sending a message, maybe our country is not the richest country in the world, but at least I'm more competent than potential alternatives. And this is the message which is sometimes very subtle and very sophisticated. And finally, as I said, they, uh, they pretend to be Democrats. They not only run elections, they also say, I'm winning election in a fair way. Now, and finally, uh, the, here is the main connection to international economics. These regimes don't isolate themselves. They love to be part of globalized world because that's where economic success comes from. In today's world, it's easier to deliver economic growth if you're part of globalized economy. You get capital flows, you get technology, you get access to financial markets. Uh, and this, this is popular, because uh, whatever we think about globalization, middle-income countries benefit from globalization and uh, love the fact that you have new consumer goods, uh, love the fact that foreign investors come and deliver jobs. And the leader can say, economy is doing OK or well, so you should support me. 
And so that's, that's the idea which is very different from a country like North Korea, which willingly isolates itself. Now, the, this is why we think the change has happened. So globalization is a major, major part of that. And uh, uh, here I should say that I'm moving from data, evidence-based uh, arguments to a speculation. Because what uh, I'm going to talk about right now, why the change, why the transformation of uh, autocracies, here we only have pretty much two data points. Fear dictatorships were dominating 50 years ago, and another data point now, spin dictatorships are dominating now. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have, we don't have a, good, uh, a good way to uh, make a causal argument here. On the other hand, since we know how those regimes work in detail, we can speculate in an educated way. And so our educated uh, guess is the combination of globalization and modernization. Uh, today, if you want to be popular, it's easier to be a uh, part of global economy, especially if you are a skillful manipulator of the media. Uh, modernization also matters. Today, economic growth is based on people who are better educated. In, Stalin needed, needed uh, workers who could read and write to work in industrial uh, uh, plants. Today, you need knowledge workers, people with tertiary education. And uh, uh, this is easier to manage in a, a world with open borders, in a regime where you don't use open repression. And so this is, uh, this is what we th uh, uh, why we think the change is happening. Now, uh, our argument is not just a modernization theory. You know, American sociologist Lipset uh, 60 years ago said in his work on prerequisites of democracy that stable, consolidated democracy requires um, middle class requires educated citizens. Uh, we don't say that. We say that modernization actually results in transformation of dictatorships. So in, instead of modernization leading from autocracy to democracy, we are saying that modernization actually forces autocracy to evolve and get itself uh, uh, transformed into a new species. It's almost like a Darwinian evolution argument where in, the, in, in response to shocks of globalization and modernization, dictatorships replace its uh, archaic model with a more, uh, uh, more modern model. Now, another argument is modernization is not what matters within a country, it's also global modernization. If Silicon Valley develops social media, that matters for dictators around the world. And, uh, and this is actually what I do what I do as a researcher as well, I study the political implications of social media. Whatever we think about social media in Europe, and this is also evidence on this, and we also work on this, social media do help populists. Uh, in non-democratic countries, social media is an, an important source of transparency and accountability. And uh, in, that sense, uh, in that sense, modernization, technological progress, which happens in the US, matters for, for uh, dictatorships around the world. Same CNN, same uh, NGOs like Amnesty International and so on. So uh, then, of course, the question is what it means for the future of those regimes. And this is a message which is optimistic in the long run, but uh, not so optimistic in the short term. So in, uh, in the long run, these regimes are also, even though they're better f suited for modern open economic uh, uh, models, globalized economy, technological progress. These regimes are better suited than fear dictators, yet they face this conundrum. For economic growth, they need people with tertiary education, with uh, uh, knowledge to run a modern economy. On the other hand, people with tertiary education are more critical, are uh, more likely to notice that the country is not going in the right direction. And on this we have evidence. We actually compare people with and without uh, advanced degrees, and tertiary degrees uh, to people w without such degrees, and we find that within dictatorships, uh, these guys are more critical than, uh, than uh, less educated guys. And so they need these people for economic prosperity and therefore popularity. On the other hand, the more such people they are, the harder it is to manage this country because you need to silence these people, either through cooptation, but it costs money, or through targeted repression, or targeted censorship, it also costs money. And so eventually you have a budget problem. You cannot 
spend so much money on cooptation and, and targeted uh, repression against the educated class because you also need to deliver uh, economic prosperity to less educated class. And so these things uh, become very difficult. Now, when dictators face this challenge, sometimes they democratize intentionally or non-intentionally. In the book, we give an example of Armenia in 2018, Ecuador in 2017. Uh, but they may also want to try to go back. And uh, in the book, which we finished before the war, we actually said, look at Venezuela. Chavez was a spin dictator, Maduro was a brutal, it still is, a brutal fear dictator. You can also see how Erdogan, after 2016, has become much more repressive. And uh, whatever metrics you use, you see a lot more censorship, a lot more arrests, and wherever, uh, if, if you draw a line at a certain level, you can already say that Erdogan is a fear dictator in 2016, 17, and so on. He introduced emergency law, actually. Uh, so that is a state of emergency. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Erdogan is a, is a different example. But Putin has actually transformed uh, uh, Russia from spin dictatorship to fear dictatorship. And this transformation happened in the first week of the war. Now, as, as I said, we finished the draft uh, in May 2021. We already in this draft are saying that we see the signs of this transformation. But the actual transformation started when the war uh, began. In the first week after the war began, Putin introduced open censorship. He blocked Facebook and, and Instagram in Russia. Actually, Facebook today in Russia is called extremist organization. Um, equal to Taliban or ISIS by Russian law. Uh, he also closed down all remaining independent media. And he started to put uh, members of Navalny team in jail, so most of them actually left Russia. And so this transformation happened because Putin saw that the old model uh, actually worked less and less well. His popularity was coming down. In particular, because of the work of the opposition, the spread of uh, social media, in particular YouTube, and so on. So it's very hard to manage a country which is as educated as Russia uh, using those techniques, especially when uh, the uh, social media provide a platform to stand up to propaganda and to circumvent censorship. Overall, we are still remaining optimistic because uh, old-style dictatorships some of them can last very long can in, in Venezuela. Uh, Maduro is running the country for 10 years. GDP went down by a factor of four. 20% uh, of people left the country. Remaining people actually lost several kilograms of weight. By some estimates, 10 kilograms of weight. And still the country is run by a brutal dictator. There is no prosperity, as I said, but the regime is still there. And uh, who knows how long it will stay in, in place. Uh, Venezuelan opposition says, the regime is in place because it's supported by countries uh, like Russia and China. Without external support, it would have collapsed. Still, uh, we don't know how long it will stay, but without economic support from the outside, it would not uh, be sustainable. So uh, how should we respond? And this is, I'm, I'm coming to a close now. I'm, uh, we, again, speculate here. Uh, our argument is we want... Uh, Adversarial, adversarial engagement. We don't want full isolation. Why? Because we know that the end of those regimes is coming from within. If you have civil society, educated people who understand what's going on, who manage to inform each other and the less educated part of the society, you want to support these people. Now, the dictators don't like that. And Putin, for example, started to introduce laws on foreign agents already 10 years ago to limit the ability of uh, opposition to inform each other and, and the rest of the society. Yet, it's, uh, the, we argue that engagement with the non-governmental agents may actually be useful for undermining those regimes. Now, the other, the other measures also uh, suggest that these guys are very good in pretending, and sometimes people in the West are happy to be deceived. Uh, you get uh, those uh, uh, dictators using hybrid measures, what uh, KGB usually called active measures, hacking into the systems not just to spy, but actually to influence, uh, to 
change the information in the system, to change public opinion. And this is a, uh, an important tool that they use, and uh, people usually don't understand to what extent using corrupt money from dictatorships is a win-win uh, proposition for those regimes. These regimes are usually very corrupt. One exception is Lee Kuan Yew, uh, but that's truly an exception. Uh, other regimes, since they need to pretend to be democratic, uh, and on the other hand, they have to co-opt the ruling elites. They have to pay ministers a lot of money, but they cannot do it openly because they need to pretend to pay them as much as they get in European countries. They have to pay the elites in a corrupt way. Thierry mentioned oligarchs. Oligarchs are a uh, feature rather than a bug in those systems. So these regimes are corrupt, and then they use this corrupt money to penetrate Western democratic institutions, buying former heads of states, heads of governments, parliament members, journalists. And then, if they succeed to pay this money and keep it secret, they get access to technology, they uh, bring uh, foreign investment, they avoid sanctions. That's great. Sometimes these stories come out and we discover that the former head of government was actually paid to lobby on behalf of non-democratic regime. In this case, the dictator comes back to his citizens and say, look, you are telling me I'm corrupt, but they are corrupt as well. And this is great for the narrative of, of, of a spin dictator to say, maybe we are not doing a good job, but we are not much worse than the West itself. And that also brings us to the second recommendation, which is somewhat obvious, but for the narrative of those regimes, it's important to say the West is underperforming. So whenever, whenever uh, there is a corruption problem, growing inequality, uh, financial crisis, it adds to the narrative of those regimes. And of course, uh, um, of course hel helping, uh, helping uh, fighting inequality or increasing supply chain resilience is important for the uh, Western countries on its own, but it's just also important for those regimes because those regimes thrive on problems in the West. Another issue, and this is a very important dimension, is international organizations. These regimes pretend to be democratic. They enter international organizations and they try to use them. And 2022 showed us Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey uses that to slow down accession of Finland and Sweden and instrumentalizes it for its own non-democratic regime within Turkey. Orban is a member of EU. He's done a lot to slow down uh, introduction of sanctions. Uh, we talk in the book uh, about uh, the leadership of Interpol, uh, which is actually in France, is investigated for torturing people. Right? So all of that is, that's a, that's a Middle Eastern general who, who is running Interpol. Right? So all of that, all of that uh, suggests that we need to think about what we can do with the international organizations. And here I don't have good answers for you. Because the way the Charter of the UN is written, it's very hard to kick out Russia even now. Well, Russia has been excluded from UN Human Rights Commission, but it's still a permanent member of the Security Council. And finally, uh, we, we support, again, this is related to uh, the issue that uh, whenever the West uh, says one, things, one thing and does another thing, that again, uh, provides a fertile ground for non-democratic non narratives. And so this is, also, this is also true. So whenever you say one thing and do another thing, they will use it as a precedent. And so that has to be avoided. So uh, let me conclude. So the main takeaway is majority of non-democratic regimes are now based on um, manipulation of information rather than on repression. Uh, they try to fake democracy. They have opposition. They have independent media with a limited reach. They have uh, elections, but they make sure that they win elections. Sometimes they make mistakes. And Erdogan, for example, lost several important elections. Um, Orban cannot get control of uh, capital city Budapest. Uh, he lost election in Budapest as well but he still won an election even in 2022 during the war, which was quite striking. Uh, they talk differently, they look differently, and the reason they came about 
to uh, prosper is because in today's world, the model based on spin is uh, more um, uh, is more suited to the realities of global economy. Globalization, which uh, uh, which uh, came about in the recent decades, uh, I see a lot of young people here. In 1980s or 90s, people would say the second wave of globalization, which is comparable to what has happened before World War One. Uh, Ten years ago, especially before the global financial crisis, it was clear that we went farther, substantially farther. And in general, it's good. It's good for fighting global poverty for all kinds of reasons. There are winners and losers. I will not talk much about this. But one thing which has happened, the old model is relatively less economically efficient in this reality than the new model. And so the opening up of the global economy essentially created incentives to transform the dictatorships. Now, uh, the way I talk about this, you may think that uh, uh, spin dictatorships are really bad and they're bad. But when you think about uh, uh, level of repression, they're less bloody and less repressive. They may be more cunning in presenting themselves as Democrats, but at least, at least these regimes are less cruel. And that's already one, uh, one uh, reason for optimism. Another reason for optimism is they pretend to be Democrats for a good reason. Because they know that the idea of democracy is actually popular. Uh, populist leaders, non-democratic leaders come to voters and say, I will have an election and I will an election. I will not use open violence. And that is actually something that uh, should uh, should provide grounds for optimism because these guys don't have another idea, another good idea to convince the voters. They take our idea, and in that sense, in the long run, I think we should, we should uh, remain optimistic. I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei. This was a really very, very fascinating uh, it, uh, lecture, really interesting. I have a lot of questions, but I will refrain because I see that Thierry wants to ask a question already. I see his... Just to, uh, to be a little bit provocative and then stimulate more people in the, in the audience to ask questions, uh, just I wanted to make two, two comments. One on all the figures that I saw, all the pictures that I saw of bloody and uh, ugly dictators, there are two of them that I don't see. And I'm surprised. One is Park Chung-hee of South Korea. The other one is Chiang Kai-shek from Taiwan. And those two dictators, supposedly, they reflect what economists think is the best of the world from a purely, let's say, theoretical point of view, benevolent dictators. We know that democracy is the least imperfect political system, but when we do our normative analysis, we generally try to do them thinking about having somewhere in the back of the picture a benevolent dictator that takes into account all the good things of society, not for himself, but for society, and has all the power to implement that. And for some times, at least, Many economists and, poli and policymakers will think that South Korea and Taiwan are what they are because of those two benevolent dictators, and I, was, I haven't seen them, and they look to me to move from ugly guys uh, after a war to something like is even more disguised than spin dictators. But I want to ask you what your reaction on that. The second one is, it seems that your argument is that we have uh, those guys ugly guys in the 40s, the, the 30s, the 20s, very bad dictators, bloody dictators, massacrating their populations. We moved to new guys who are a bit less bloody, at least in appearance, and, and supposedly modernization should work, globalization, forces for capital market mobility, and all the gains from trade, and all those things that we know are good from globalization, and at some point, the optimism is that we go towards democracy. And I was wondering whether we have here an absorbing point at the end, because it looks to me that also you have what is, what I, I would call 
malevolent leaders in democracies. What about Bolsonaro? What about Modi? What about even Trump? It seems that actually, even when we are supposedly in a situation where uh, we have democratic institutions, India has democratic institutions since its independence. Brazil, of course, has a whole history of military power, but the last so 85, after FT5, actually all Brazilians think that actually democracy was established. And we realize that actually things are a little bit more complicated. So maybe sometimes when we are in those middle income countries, democratic institutions, as much as they are implemented, are subject to erosion and given back to spin dictators. So malevolent dictate leaders in democracies could revert to spin dictators and eventually all over the chain to bloody dictators, as you mean, you suggest for, for Putin. So, that, those are two my remarks. Thank you very much, Thierry. Both are uh, very relevant uh, questions. Um, so uh, Taiwan and South Korea indeed are examples of authoritarian modernization. Uh, uh, these examples remain very few. I, I mentioned Singapore. Singapore uh, um, started a bit later uh, and uh, already um, Lee Kuan Yew decided not to use open repression while uh, while in Taiwan and in uh, South Korea, these leaders emerged from the war. Both of them uh, were actually generals, as you rightly said, and uh, initially they were using uh, a lot of repression, uh, and they were successful in industrialization. Now, the next question is, what do you do today? Would they succeed in taking Korea South Korea and Taiwan to be in high income countries based on knowledge economy. And this is exactly what I mean that modernization contributes to this transformation. Because actually Singapore, except for oil monarchies, Singapore in the world today is the only country which is a democracy and high income country. Taiwan and Korea transformed its political system before becoming high income countries. And, uh, and uh, this is what some economists would call middle-income trap. For building a post-industrial economy, you need more freedoms, more decentralization, and um, uh, I guess uh, you can talk about uh, neo schumpeterian uh, growth model of Philippe Aguillon, uh, who says that uh, you need a different set of institutions, including political institutions, uh, and, uh, if you want to develop. And what's happened in Korea and Taiwan whether they were fortunate or this is just how it happened, they were lucky to have in place democratic institutions when they actually needed them to continue growth. So you can think about a model where people would say Korea and uh, Taiwan need non-democratic regimes because uh, these non-democratic regimes contribute to economic growth. But we've had an experiment. These countries have become democracies and continue to grow and continue to be technological leaders in reasonably hostile environment. Actually, with uh, Philippe Aguillon, we have a paper which looks at how Korean institutions were transformed after a global financial crisis in 1997, Asian financial crisis in 1997, 1998, and uh, the reforms which were put in place after the old model went bankrupt and was not just political institutions, but also uh, dominance of oligarchs, dominance of, uh, of uh, uh, chebols. These institutions were transformed. The country became much more open, including to open uh, to foreign investors, and productivity growth accelerated. So this particular uh, example shows that uh, more decentralized models may actually work better. Uh, but I agree with you, these two countries remain major exceptions, together with uh, Singapore, which shows that dictatorships can be, can be uh, economically successful. But once again, these countries have not become what they are today with dictatorships. They industrialized, but post-industrial development actually happened after democratization. Uh, on uh, uh, your absorbing state, uh, once again, uh, what we are saying is uh, we cannot predict the future. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we can speculate that indeed spin dictators are better fit for today's reality, but they also face those challenges. And that's why some of them, with a great cost to their economy and to their popularity, go back to 20th century model. Some of them lose power. And what you are talking about is democracy, what's happening in democracies. All the names you've given are people who want to become spin dictators. 
So the, and you forgot one name, which I also almost named in my talk, Silvia Berlusconi, who is a great teacher of Vladimir Putin. Uh, so Silvia Berlusconi also captured media, right? There is, uh, there is a great set of papers written by Italian political economists, going back to my puzzle in the beginning of the talk. Silvia, Silvia Berlusconi provided so many ideas for Italian political economists. Uh, so they keep studying them and keep publishing in top journals because uh, there is so much to do on uh, his model of capturing media, co-opting media, uh, using media he already has for staying in power. But eventually, he stepped down. And eventually, his party is no longer important because Italian democratic institutions passed this test. Same in America. Maybe Trump will come back. At this moment, it doesn't look likely. But uh, in 2020, he lost. He lost by a very thin margin, I agree. But still, American institutions stood the test. Bolsonaro, the same thing. Bolsonaro wanted to become a spin dictator, but he didn't succeed. He may still succeed later on, who knows? But at this moment, he lost. Uh, Modi, I fully agree with you. Uh, so actually, some political scientists already called India a non-democracy. So a simple, a simple uh, thing when we teach political economy, we say, there is a march of history with all the backlashes and democratic recessions. There are more democratic countries today than 200 years ago, which is true. Uh, but uh, then, say, four years ago, I would say, most, uh, uh, most people on the planet live in democracies. Today, I have to say, that depends how you count democracies. According to polity, Majority of humanity lives in democracies. According to VDEM, majority of humanity lives in autocracies because VDEM qualifi qualifies, uh, um, categorizes India as a non-democracy already. But the short answer to your question is, many spin dictators become spin dictators like Orban through winning elections, undermining political checks and balances, capturing media, capturing courts, and creating a spin dictatorship. Many leaders like Bolsonaro and Trump tried, but didn't succeed. And one battleground, especially before the war, was Poland. In Poland, the uh, uh, Law and Justice Party was following urban steps, but uh, not as efficiently, because in Poland you have your own uh, specificities. And also the protests in Belarus and uh, the war, uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine, change the political dynamic as well. So there is much more pro-European tendencies now uh, than before in Poland on all sides of the debate. So maybe they will not succeed. But when they came to power, they started to try to capture courts. They, uh, they uh, tried to capture media and so on and so forth. Another country is Israel. Israel today is following this road and uh, very quickly. And so how it plays out, we don't know. But uh, this is what, when you talk to Israeli people, they say uh, your book is very relevant because we have this transformation going on as we speak. So that may happen. That may actually happen, but let's hope that our democratic institutions stand up to those challenges. Uh, Sergei, the question that is coming from the floor is where do you place China between spin and fear dictatorship? It's coming from... Uh, this, uh, this is a very good question, and we talk about that in the book, and basically China is in a category of its own. Uh, probably together with Saudi Arabia and Emirates. Basically, uh, in Emirates you have elements of spin, but all these countries are digital dictatorships. So if you look at China, China is a fear regime. It's very clear, it's based on fear, uh, there are things going on in Xinjiang which are horrible. You have forced confessions of dissidents on TV in the rest of the country. This is something that we saw in Russia in the 1930s, um, in Soviet Union in the 1930s. So there is no question about uh, the fear uh, features of the regime. On the other hand, it's extremely sophisticated digital autocracy. So they use digital technology for monitoring, for surveillance, 
and for preventing protests. So they don't need to put many people in jail. They instill fear in a preventive way. So citizens don't protest because they know that face recognition software will calculate who they are and put them in jail, like in Belarus. So what's happening now in Belarus, they use face recognition software, and they said, in 2020, you were in the protest. We take you, we torture you, we put you in jail. Uh, so this is this is the approach. But in China, of course, technology is uh, much better than Belarus. Belarus Belarusians also buy it from China and Russia. Uh, so one thing which should scare us, I was pretty optimistic. I don't know. I, I, it was not very cheerful talk, but it, in the end I tried to give you some optimism. Now, let me tell you what scares me. In China, you have this symbiosis of digital technology and non-democratic government. In Europe, we uh, protect privacy. Uh, we limit access to data. In China, there is no such thing as GDPR. Uh, they don't protect privacy, so government can get a huge mass of data and give it to artificial intelligence firms. Artificial intelligence is a technology which needs big data to train algorithms. Uh, and um, and uh, you have this uh, uh, symbiosis of AI firms which benefit from access to big data, and government, uh, which benefits from algorithm for face recognition, surveillance, and so on. And so that potential may create a situation where a non-democratic government gets ahead in the technological rates, because AI has this specificity that it needs big data, and Chinese government may have a lot of big data. Now, if you talk to AI people in the US or Israel, they say, don't worry, creativity matters in a AI, and creativity cannot prosper in China. And that's exactly what destroyed Soviet Union. The lack of uh, creativity, decentralization, competition, eventually undermined innovation, and so Soviet Union lost the technological race. But that aspect of AI scares me. But uh, people in Israel would say, look, number of AI startups in Israel is higher, just a number, not a per capita number, but a total number is higher than in China. And Chinese AI is about application, while American and, and Israeli AI uh, startups are about creating new ideas, and so we will be ahead, but who knows? That, that, that scares me. Yes, it is scaring the combination of the two. It's definitely scaring because, I mean, it's really using AI for fear, for creating fear. I mean, that's, I mean, once... Every, they control everything, that's what you're creating. Other questions? Someone wants to ask a question? Uh, yes. Quick one. Uh, no, wait, 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 wait. One second. Here we are. Maybe it's uh, a bit provocative. Is there an explanation in your book why all these disgraceful people are men? <laughs> So this is, this is a great question, and uh, I think uh, um, we've not identified uh, a character who is not a man. So our book is actually structured in a, in a way that every chapter tells you about a tool that a spin dictatorship user uses. So it's a chapter on propaganda, chapter on censorship, chapter on using cross-border trade, uh, chap chapter on using targeted uh, repression. And each chapter tells you a story of a dictator. So there is a chapter on Lee Kuan Yew, chapter on Nazarbayev, chapter on Putin, and so on. They're all men. They're all men. And the reason for that is fear dictatorship. Fear dictators are men because they want to project fear. Uh, they wear military uniform, and that's what they do. And um, spin dictators are men because they pretend to be Democrats, and most democratic leaders are still men. Right? It's, uh, it's changing, and it will change, uh, but uh, we don't have an explanation, but, uh, but this is what it is. Now, what other thing I would, I would like to mention is these dictatorships are mostly personalistic, based on one person, and uh, uh, dictatorships can be monarchies, they can be religion-based, they can be military, uh, they can be party-based, and spin dictatorships are usually none of those because party-based systems are usually ideological, and this is not uh, one-party systems uh, are usually ideological, and this is not what spin dictators do. Monarchy is an open autocracy. Religion has an ideology. Re theocracy has an ideology like Iran. Um, and uh, military dictatorship is a fear dictatorship. So these regimes are usually based on one person. 
And as you rightly said, they are all men, and we don't have counterexamples to this. I was fa fa fascinating about thinking about history. So in the ancients, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, uh, dictators exist bef before, I don't know, eight, eightings. So once there were the monarch, can we define a king of a nation as, a, or maybe, I don't know, it's a word that has been invented from the monarchy to define the difference between the nobility and these bad guys. Is, is it, maybe not, but it's like a dictators, uh, maybe the young, I don't know. And then I was thinking about Dubai, uh, is, is a monarchy. Uh, I was, as has been to Dubai some months ago, I was feeling like a kind of different type of fear because they like acting like in your goodwill. If you follow the rule, you're, you will be, grow wealth. If you're not, I, I don't know what happened. Um, right, uh, so if I understand your question, uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, democracy is a reasonably recent phenomenon. You can think about uh, ancient Greece, but slaves didn't vote, as you know, right? Um, a majority of people in certain Middle Eastern dictatorships also don't vote because they are immigrants. Um, so um, we actually quote uh, Aristotle, who already in his book on politics already talked about various ways tyrants can control masses, and he already talked about something like this. We also talk about Napoleon III, who initially was a Democrat <laughs> and then became a dictator, and he used some tactics like this. Uh, essentially, the uh, history, history replaced kings with republics, and then in many republics you have created those dictators. And uh, this is the 20th century phenomenon. So actually, I said the 20th century dictators because before that you had legitimacy of kings coming from God. And then the um, enlightenment, uh, wars, brutal wars undermined this legitimacy. People stopped believing that uh, those failing models are coming from divine uh, legitimacy, authority. And so other sources of authority came into being, like ideological dictatorships in Germany, Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, and um, that has changed. But uh, as I said, after uh, 30 years ago, there is no more challenge to democratic model. And one thing I didn't mention, if you ask me for one moment in history, that would be the fall of Berlin Wall the end of history, like Fukuyama said, end of history. No more challenge to democratic idea. And now we do have a challenge, which is China. Uh, but at that point, it looked like you want to run a country, you need to pretend to be a Democrat. And that's, uh, that, that turning point is something which created this, uh, this model, because it became a more viable model than before. Also, one of the things I would mention, before the end of the Cold War, the West would support very brutal anti-communist fear dictatorships, because Cold War was an existential challenge to the West. And the West would close its eyes on violation of human rights of anti-communist regimes. After the end of the Cold War, it's much less, much less of that. The West can support allies in the war on terror, but it's much smaller phenomenon. Uh, Professor Gurevi, congratulations for your lecture. I would like to listen about the uh, internet democracy and regulation and a possible regulation trap. I mean, uh, this misuse of internet uh, could create a situation that, uh, um, you know, asking for a regulation, this regulation could reduce freedom in internet and it's exactly what the spin dictator wants, and how society can manage it, and how democracy can manage it, and how a good regulation could avoid this uh, regulation trap. Thank you for the privilege to ask a few. Thank you, it's, uh, it's a great question, and I, as a scholar of social media, I can tell you I strongly believe we need to regulate social media more aggressively in the West, because currently, whatever self-regulation efforts uh, Facebook makes, it's not enough. And uh, social media remain the tool of choice of populists, and most of today's populists are authoritarian populists who want to become spin dictators. Um, 
And uh, I work on this, and uh, I, I, I can tell you that the whole business model of social media, especially advertising-based business model, is something that creates incentives to disseminate false information, simple messages, and so on. On the other hand, whenever we say we in the West need to regulate social media, people in the East say, see, they want censorship, and we will do censorship too. And it's not censorship, it's regulation, right? We just want to protect our kids from pedophiles. That's how re uh, censorship online started in Russia. We need to protect kids from pedophiles. That's why we will regulate internet. And so uh, every thing which is happening in the West can be used as a justification for censorship, which is not called censorship, because people like Putin would say, look at the United States, it's a democracy. We think it's a democracy. And they have a foreign aid law, a foreign, sorry, foreign agent registration act from 1930s against the Nazi agents. So we will also introduce foreign agents law. Uh, and uh, we, they are a democracy, and we are a democracy, so why not? So these issues are not simple. And, uh, and once again, I think we need to regulate more uh, social media. I'm very happy we have Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. But at the same time, from this point of view, from the point of view of spin dictators, it's wonderful. Every interference in informational uh, uh, battleground is great for those guys because they say democracies do it, we also do it. Which goes back, and then maybe we can take another question, we can conclude. That goes back at your link between the transformation of dictatorships and globalization and modernization. In a way, what is interesting that up to when spin dictators stayed within limits in a globalized world, we could think at a you know, global system which was a rule-based system, so where people were following rules. We were discussing this last night with Thierry. But then what happened in Russia now, and what has been happening partly in China with the appropriation of technologies and maybe Taiwan, et cetera, is as it happened that spin dictators passed a certain threshold. And so essentially a rule-based system is no longer enough, no? A rule-based system was what was keeping them within boundaries, because in any way they needed to trade, they needed to be modern, they needed to be sufficiently app apparently democratic to survive in that world and trade and make money, okay? And provide some benefits to their people. But then suddenly, they're turning into sphere dictators made this rule-based system impossible, okay? And now we're talking about French shoring, enemy shoring, blocks, world in blocks, etc. because essentially these, these countries, spin dictators, passed a threshold, they passed a limit. So where, where, where are we going to end up? I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, can we go back to a rule-based system or not? So um, we are in Italy. This is a country with a rule of law, rule-based, and still you have criminals. So sometimes uh, Italians kill each other, sometimes Italians steal from each other, and the rule-based society puts them in jail, or tries to put them in but jail. The share is not as large as the share of China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's a good point. That's an excellent point. And basically, the... Uh, but in the, the answer in theory is the fact that crime happens, deviation from uh, rules happens, doesn't say that we live in a system with, in which we don't have rules. Uh, but the question is whether we have enough power to enforce the rules. And enforcing the rules is costly. When you need to put an Italian citizen in jail, somebody has to pay for the jail and for the police. It's uh, unfortunate. We could have spent this money in a better way. And so French shoring is costly for the West. But uh, the West says we are happier to pay uh, this cost than to pay the cost of the war, which is substantial. So in principle, that per se, the fact that Russia violates the rules doesn't mean that rules don't exist. Russia is paying for violating the rules by economic recession, by lack of future, so, and by shortening the life expectancy of Putin's regime. 
A lot of people say that last year Putin made a catastrophic mistake for his own sake. So this war is also bad for him, not only for Ukrainians or for the whole world. And so he's already been punished. He's probably not punished enough for the reason you mentioned, that Russia is so big and has nuclear weapons, so you cannot put Putin in jail physically because he has nuclear weapons. And objectively, this is a problem. Yes, nuclear power can say, I do what I want, you don't touch me because otherwise I will destroy the world. And there are political scientists who say exactly this. It's a famous political scientist in the US called John Mearsheimer, who says, we should accept defeat. We don't want to start World War III. If Putin grabs Ukraine, what can we do? And uh, yet we see that there is a unity in the West to do another thing, to push back on Putin. Uh, Putin has not won this war and has not yet used nuclear weapons. So I fully agree with you that we don't know how it's going to happen, what's going to give, but at least the West, at least, believes that we still need to try to enforce, enforce those rules. But it's hard, because Russia is big, Russia has a lot of resources, China is even bigger, China has even more resources, but see, China is not invading Taiwan. And that tells you that uh, there is something in this calculation that uh, stops China. So China values being at least, uh, respecting at least some rules, and so in that sense, I think uh, we still don't know what's going on. But the, once again, the very fact of violating the rules doesn't mean that rules don't exist. But the problem is when to, when to enforce the rule, you have to move from the WTO to tax. Yes. That's, that's a crucial issue. Well, the I same is uh, when Italians kill each other. You also yeah. need to move from uh, stock exchange and university to police stations. Other question? Okay. Yes, there, in the back, last question. Hi, thank you. Uh, I, I think it just goes back to what you were saying. But, so how effective are sanctions um, in, in, in the context of the war and in general in uh, helping fight spin dictators? So uh, sanctions are important, and especially for spin dictators, because spin dictators want to show popu uh, competence. They want to show economic prosperity. If sanctions can reduce economic growth or remove economic growth, they undermine dictators' popularity. And that is something that you see, actually, my co-author, Dan Tridman, wrote a whole paper on popularity of, uh, we actually have together another paper, a recent paper, uh, on popularity of non-democratic regimes around the world, and we show that if you have better economic performance, you have more popularity based on Gallup data. Gallup data don't uh, go to fear a dictatorship, so there is no Gallup poll in North Korea or in China. But using Gallup data on these regimes, we show that if you produce more economic growth, it's better for your popularity. If you actually convince people that there is economic growth, that's also good for your popularity. We show that both objective and subjective components of perceptions matter. So if people just think economy is doing well because you have censorship, that's great. If, if people think you have free media, that's also good for popularity. If they rec recognize that censorship exists, that's bad for popularity. So all these uh, intuitive things really matter. So if sanctions manage to destroy economic performance, it undermines the stability of the regime. Now, your next question is whether sanctions actually undermine Russian economic performance in 2022 and 2023. And the answer to this question is yes. So... Um, they were very high unrealistic expectations in March, April, when people would say Russian economy will lose 10% of GDP in 2022. This was unrealistic, and that was based on our experience with regimes like Iran or Venezuela, where you had incompetent macroeconomic policymakers. Russia has competent macroeconomic policymakers, which actually trained by me, which pains me personally. That's a personal tragedy, tragedy for me that Russian central bankers are my former colleagues, my former students, and uh, I think that uh, these people are not doing uh, the right thing. And the reason for that is very simple. These people may stabilize economy right now, but they, they save money for Putin. And every billion dollars that they save for Putin now kills Ukrainians, destroy Ukraine, which means we Russian taxpayers in the future will have to pay reparations. So it, 
it looks like they're saving the economy, but in the long run, they hurt Russian citizens. There is no question about this. But coming back to sanctions. So before the war, the forecast was plus 3% growth. Now it's minus 3% uh, outcome. And re recession continues. It will be minus 2% in 2023. Now GDP numbers actually overestimate performance of Russian economy. Why? Because you know that uh, during the war, it's... Uh, very easy to increase GDP by producing more munitions, more arms. You produce $1 billion more munitions, GDP goes up by $1 billion. These munitions kill Ukrainians, don't increase quality of life of Russians, in the long run undermine quality of life of Russians because of reparations. So GDP dynamics actually are a bad measure of quality of life. If you look at quality of life measures, like for example, retail trade, how much Russians spend in, in retail shops, the number is minus 10% in comparable numbers. So it's, it's a reasonable shock. Um, Putin is not popular, but we don't know that because no longer you can trust the polls because you have open censorship, open repression. So, so that is that is true. Um, and final argument that sanctions just started. <laughs> so the real sanctions are sanctions on Russian oil, and they started in the beginning of December. And uh, sanctions on Russian oil products will only start next uh, Sunday, Sunday after next, February 5th. So the real sanctions only begin. All 2022, Putin continued to sell oil and oil products to Europe and got hundreds of billions of dollars. Thank you very much, Sergey. I think we exploited you to the possible limit. So really, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Thierry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.